Uh, thank you, Emily. Thank you, The Strand. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And thank you, distinguished panelists. Uh, because I'm an active duty Army officer, I have to say this, that everything that I say is my own opinion and does not reflect DA or DOD policy, all right? So I always say that, and then I also say, like, at the end of my remarks, or after I get through talking, the end of the event, tell me if I needed to say that for any reason, right? So, so and that caveat does not apply to these guys at all. They can just let it rip, all right? So we're here today to honor uh, Adrian Bonenberger, uh, the author of the new memoir, Afghan Post. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Adrian and our other panelists, and I'm going to introduce or bring Adrian up. He's going to read a passage uh, from Afghan Post. Um, after that, I will sort of direct some questions um, that bring in our other panelists and allow them to talk about what they admire in, uh, in Afghan Post or what, they, or what is on their mind in regard to war literature or the wars or the military or or our remembrance of uh, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, or, or whatever, um, whatever comes to mind in the course of the hour. And then we'll definitely leave some time at the end for questions from the audience, because I know a lot of you have really great questions that, you're, that you want to get these guys' opinion on. So, to, uh, to get going here, Adrian Bonenberger grew up in Branford, Connecticut, the son of a classical <coughs> guitar-playing father and a mother who wrote poetry. At Yale, Adrian wrote for the Yale Record, the nation's oldest college humor magazine. So he's a funny guy. Uh -huh. Very funny. <laughs> Uh, and he majored in English. After college, he taught English in Japan, and then at approximately age 26, joined the Army to become an infantry officer, which is very much parallel to my own biography, which is one reason I warmed immediately to, uh, to Afghan Post and Adrian's story. After completing uh, training, ranger school and jump school and assorted other schools at Fort Benning, he was assigned as a lieutenant in the 173rd Airborne Brigade, one of the Army's very, very elite units. And then he also served as a captain in the 10th Mountain Division at Fort Drum, New York, where I also served. As a lieutenant and captain, Adrian deployed to Afghanistan twice, one at each rank, where he earned two bronze stars, as well as the coveted combat infantryman's badge. After leaving the service, he moved to New York and began writing Afghan Post, One Soldier's Correspondence from America's Forgotten War, a collection of letters and journal entries that tell the story of his decision to join the military his training at Fort Benning and his actual service with the 173rd Airborne Brigade in the 10th Mountain Division. Um, and then a brief account of his life just after departing the Army. Afghan Post was published earlier this year on the Head in the Hand Press and is now what we are here tonight to both celebrate and discuss. Adrian is currently enrolled in Columbia University's Journalism School class of 2014, which means you won't be enrolled for long, right? If all goes well, so congratulations on that. Okay, so our other guests are also <coughs> distinguished war writers. I'll say just a bit about them. Matt Gallagher grew up in, in uh, Reno, Nevada, attended college at Wake Forest University in North Carolina, and was commissioned into the Army Cavalry through Wake Forest ROTC program in 2005. A few years later, he found himself in Iraq as a platoon leader. One of the first officers or soldiers to take advantage of, the inter of internet publishing opportunities, Matt began a blog titled Kaboom, great title, Kaboom, that recounted his day-to-day -day activities and thoughts about being a platoon leader in a combat zone. It soon ran afoul of authority, predictably enough, right? <laughs> um, but his entry served as the basis for the memoir Matt published in 2010 after he got out of the Army. And that uh, memoir is, is again called Kaboom, Embracing the Suck in a Savage Little War. And that came out on the Capo Press. Matt is n now finishing an MFA at Columbia? Or? Done. Done. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Completing a novel and publishing nonfiction in a variety of print and online uh, venues. Uh, we also have with tonight Roxana Robinson, the author of at least five novels and three collections of stories, all of which have been bestsellers, critically acclaimed prize winners, or both. She's also the author of a biography of painter Georgia O'Keeffe. In 2013, she published Sparta uh, on uh, Sarah Crichton Press. And Sparta is a fictional account of an ex-Marine officer's difficulty readjusting to peacetime civilian life after a difficult tour in Iraq. Uh, her protagonist, Conrad, was a classics major at Williams, so a highly educated background 
that bears some similarity to Adrian's, Matt's, David's, and my own experience. And it'll be interesting to hear her perspectives on this phenomenon. So uh, last, but definitely not least, is David Abrams. David, <laughs> da yes, yes, David served 20 years in the Army as a public affairs office, non-commissioned officer, to include a tour in Iraq in 2005. After retiring in 2008, he commenced work in the Public Affairs Office in the Bureau of Land Management in Montana and also began working in earnest on the novel Fobbit. Uh, Fobbit's a satirical portrait of military life on a large, comfy, relatively safe forward operating base in Iraq. And it came out in 2012, on, published by Grove Atlantic, made numerous best of list, and brought David many more speaking and writing engagements. Okay, so that's, those are our panelists. I now want to bring up Adrian. He's going to read a selection from Afghan Post, and then we'll get into the, the questions and the discussion. So how about a round of applause for all our panelists? And especially for Adrian Bodenberg. Uh, to begin with, great to see everyone here. Uh, it's wonderful to see so many friends and uh, even family, people from all walks of life and all phases of my life and some really great uh, veteran writers and just authors in general. Um, the selection I'm going to read, it's, it's just a letter. This is actually the first time I've read a letter from my memoirs. Usually I read journal entries. Um, because it's easier to read a thing that is me basically talking to myself, me talking to another person. It always struck me as strangely intimate in a way that I wasn't prepared for, um, but talked it over. And this letter, um, the, the background surrounding it is, um, during my second deployment in 2010, we were in northern Afghanistan operating under the German army. So I was under a German general, General Fritz. Uh, so we got air support from the Luftwaffe and panzer support from, you know, they, I mean, they had the Iron Cross on the tanks and everything. It was really weird, a bizarre, bizarre <laughs> place, as you can imagine. And um, so I had this one mission. We we're supposed to go up to the north, and we lined up for the military guys out there, every asset you could imagine. We had a tactical SFA team, Special Forces A team. We had Apache support overhead, like task to us. We had an RCP engineer group. We had, I had a company plus. We had uh, like 200 militia. And at the last minute, the one component that was necessary for doing this mission, the Afghan National Police, my technical partner, they pulled out, they bailed on it. And uh, there were some reporters there. And it was, it, it kind of, it ended up being a debacle. And it turned out, uh, I, I learned about two hours into the process of this sort of having all of these assets and this great potential for, for an operation that was going to be able to, I thought, knock out the Taliban in that area, uh, that the general of the Afghan National Police had been fired. So this was very much, in many ways, uh, I, probably my lowest professional moment in the military, certainly in that deployment. And it's written to a good old friend of mine, Jim Danley, who is, uh, who's, he's out now too. He's a, 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 an FSO in Iraq. Um, Dear Jim, for the first time in a long while, I really miss having a shoulder to cry on. I'm not sure anyone other than you would understand what I mean by that, the emotions that work here. I put together a great mission, had helicopters, SF support, engineer assets, two platoons, and my partners all refused to show up. The New York Times guys were there to catch it all, my ineffectiveness as a commander, the complete letdown. I've never been filled with such anger or impotence in my life. It was galling, mortifying, infuriating, hateful. My lowest point yet as a leader. It was one of those things where you can't tell your partner everything about a mission beforehand or you risk compromising it when he tells his cousins in the Taliban that you're coming. So I told him we'd be returning to the north, which he told me he wanted, then asked for support a couple weeks before, a week before, and finally a couple days before, received promises that he would provide soldiers, laid all the groundwork, and then the day of, nothing. No Afghan border police, no Afghan national police, nothing. The militia were, ready, were willing to roll, their NDS handler said he'd be able to ante up whatever I needed in terms of militia support, 100, 150, 200, whatever, but they're officially not my partners. I can't be seen working exclusively with armed gangsters with no oversight or accountability mechanisms. If it had been up to me, I would have taken the offered support and the 200 some odd US soldiers we had in the form of the joint elements and rolled north to really tear into some Taliban ass, but I got reeled in by hire. The cause, supposedly, was the removal of the old provincial police chief, a general, 
an Uzbek, and the, apportment, and the appointment of a new guy from Parwan province, also a general, a Tajik. This either emboldened my partners to stand up and say, no, or something else was going on. I'm not sure what. It's Ramadan, so that might have contributed, but it's very unusual for Afghans to say that they will participate in a mission and then all back out at the last minute. Usually one can play a faction off against another, promise more aid to one group, curry favor with the other, whatever the case may be. This time I got nothing. And I'll probably never see most of those assets for a long time. How many times have you gotten a full Special Forces Tactical A team with a company of Afghan commandos to show up for a mission? Have you ever seen that? Well, I can put that dream to bed. It's fucking bullshit. While everyone else returned to base, SF to their base, the Apaches to, Maz the Apaches to Mazari Sh Sharif, the engineers in my third platoon brought the New York Times reporters back to Fab Kandus. I and my first platoon decided to explore a village just south of Imam Sahib, which was supposed to have some minor Taliban presence. We ambled down through the fields, bounding, 10 of us, no Afghan support. The town looked deserted, the doors closed and barred, everyone having run away or hidden in their compounds upon seeing us. We reached the last compound in the village, and one of the soldiers said, Sir, it smells like weed here. He was right. It was pungent, thick. I looked around, tried to see if there were any free-growing plants. Another soldier shouted to look on the ground. We were standing on a dirt trail, a wagon trail, that was covered for 20 feet by a half-inch layer of marijuana, just drying in the sun. The turp was banging on a door, asking a woman inside the compound, who said that her husband was out in the fields. We decided it was a bad situation, especially with the sticky icky and the soldiers, so we started back for the vehicles. Got in a bit of a scrape, and shot it out with the Taliban for an hour, made the vehicles, and headed home. I'll, end up, I'll, I'll just end there. Okay, so thank you, Adrian. And uh, a little bit tricky here trying to, to get this conversation rolling, but I think the first question will go, uh, we'll ask uh, Adrian to sort of explain why the epistolary novel, right, or epistolary form, right? What was sort of the sorting out process as you knew you wanted to write about uh, your experience in the military? Probably, I think the, your introduction, or maybe I've read that you worked through a variety of drafts using different forms, etc., etc. I could just wonder if you could explain to all of us how you finally hit upon the use of your letters and the journals to tell the story. And I'm going to ask, I'm going to bring Matt Gallagher in next, because Matt also is the author of a memoir from very early in the game that avoids sort of conventional narrativizing, right? Um, it's told more in the, in the, in the form of sh uh, fragments or anecdotes and episodes, and I know you've kept a close eye on the memoir form, so maybe you could respond to uh, Adrian's uh, comments. Well, I had a, a couple of false starts. Uh, I got out of the military in January of 2012, um, and I went to France for a little while and, uh, and started writing a memoir that looked suspiciously like Siegfried Sassoon's memoirs to an in, uh, by an infantry memoirs of an infantry officer, uh, but mine wasn't as good, and so I cut bait on it pretty quickly. Uh, and I tried again with, uh, with something that started uh, looking suspiciously like Catch-22, but a lot worse. <laughs> I just kept forcing it. And, uh, and eventually I, I got back to, uh, to America and I actually uh, I, I moved back in with my parents and uh, I gave myself a little bit of space and I started writing, uh, and I thought to myself, what's, what's the, what, how do you enjoy writing? Because the stuff where you're forcing it, just, it's not working for you. Um, and I thought, well, you know, I wrote in my journal a lot. I wrote a lot of letters to people. I wrote a lot of emails to people when I had time. You always have time. There's tons of downtime when you're in the military. Um, why don't I just do that? And so I went back and I, I looked at the, the emails and, and the letters and the journal entries, and, um, and it was, uh, it, 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 I enjoyed writing that way, so that pulled me in, but it also became a sort of compulsion. Um, and I realized pretty quickly that this, this was, in fact, the best way for me to, uh, to honestly say how things had happened to me. Um, and so I, 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 I did my best to sort of take, out, take off the gloves and, and go bare knuckle with, with the experience. So, so uh, before Matt jumps in, uh, a quick question. How, much of the, how many of the letters were emails and how many were like really like old-fashioned letters? Uh, I'd say probably 30%. And all, all of the most, the most reflective, most important items to me were items where I sat down at my desk with my space pen and a piece of paper. 
<laughs> and wrote a letter. That's quite re remarkable. I think most of us would say that uh, communication back from the war zone these days generally takes the form of social media, emails, right? I'm not so sure there's so many letter writers. Ah, but letters to the states are free. Free mail, remember? <laughs> <laughs> Sure. Yeah. Uh, so one of the things that drew me to Afghan Post was uh, was the distinct style, right? I mean, war memoirs are just like regular memoirs. There's a variety. There's a variety of them out there. You know, some are written by future. You just can just see it, right? They're they're self-serving and they're going to be for future political leaders. Some are really interesting stories, and it's true. Uh, uh, some are you know interesting stories, but. Um, you know, there's there's something just not connecting on the page. Uh, 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 one of my favorite memoirs uh, uh, that happens to be a war memoir is, is A Rumor of War by Phil Caputo. He wrote that 10, 12, 15 years after, after when he went back to Vietnam as a journalist, uh, 10, 10, 12 years after his own experiences over there. Uh, and so th that has this incredible separation um, and, and distance and, and knowledge of how uh, the war played out that uh, uh, you know we, we will eventually see in, in Iraq and uh, Afghanistan war memoirs but we're, we're not there yet um, so I, I what initially drew me to Adrian's book was was kind of the, it was just doing something different it was distinct it was it, it was raw in in the way things occurred right it, it, it wasn't uh, it, it kind of removed uh, the pretense of the, the story that he wanted to tell and told the story that that was no of course simply writing sitting down and writing uh, there, there's already uh, going to be um, uh, uh, you know, an, an, there's an act of interpretation already occurring there. Uh, so there's there's no way to tell any story exactly the way it was. Uh, but but Adrian it seems like he got damn close, and I, I think that's because uh, he was able to go back to that by using this. He he was kind of almost removing memory the way that memory distorts, uh, and and. Uh, seeing who he was then and how he transformed. Uh, and uh, I wouldn't have done that. Uh, it was an incredibly brave thing to do uh, uh, as, as a writer and as a thinker and as a person. Uh, th yeah, thank you. Hey, and David and Roxanne, if you want to jump in on that as well, um, any comments on, on the memoir or the letter as memoir? No, I, actually, I have a question for Adrian, though. Sure. Um, not to steal your thunder, yeah, yeah. If, you, if you have it. But um, so, when you were when you, when you were going back over all of these emails and these letters, did you find yourself um, editing them and and shape shifting them and and you know kind of putting your own new spin on things now that you've had a little bit of a time to to look back? Um. I, I actually didn't. I mean, I, there there was some light editing that went on to protect the identities of people yeah. who did not want to participate in the book or would have, through their participation, unwilling participation, opened me up to some sort of libelous suits or things of that nature, especially some of the higher-ranking officers in the story. Um, but the... Uh, yeah, no, I, I didn't, and that was that was very important to me that, uh, you know, one of the things a lot of the, the, the veterans... Uh, and people who are interested in veteran literature are talking about right now is how to write an effective war story. And um, you know, it, it doesn't it, it doesn't seem to be to to talk about you know kicking in a hundred doors and throwing a hundred flashbang grenades and killing a thousand Taliban. It seems that that seems to be something of a distortion. Um, so I, I yeah I just I, I, I forced myself to to reread them and re-inhabit them and the letters and the journal entries. Um, based on the letters and emails and journal entries are true. Yeah. Were there uh, episodes that were important that didn't make it into Afghan Post because they didn't make it into a letter or a journal? Did you have to sort of write around some incidents? And how did you account for that? Or what should we be on the lookout for in regard to significant events of that nature? I, I did. I'm, so I'm, I'm working on fiction now um, because, you know, I, the way I said this is that this is, you know, that the memoirs were a way to factually accurate, a factually accurate way to render my experience. Mm -hmm. And there, there are certain truths that you can tell in fiction, I think, that you probably can't tell in the memoir. Um, there were some people who died under circumstances that I just, again, for, for libelous reasons, I just couldn't. I could not say them, mm -hmm. um, and it, I'm not sure that it would have been fair to the families of the people. I mean, what, what good would it do to say, you know, your son, this exact thing happened? That's not my story to tell. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, there were there were four or five incidents of, of real horror that didn't make it in, um, but they didn't. That, them not making it in didn't distract from the story. I didn't sure. think. 
sure. there were sufficient episodes of horror to, uh, <laughs> to make it up in the balance. Well, we're, we're um, sh- pretty sure we're interested in hearing about the thought process that led you into the Army at age 26 with a Yale degree and teaching experience uh, in Japan. And some a lot of that is in Afghan Post, but maybe you could just sort of um, sketch it out quickly for us now and then also talk a little bit about af- the life after uh, Afghan Post ends. Because it ends on a very dark note. And I don't know how many of you had a chance to look at it yet, but the last scene... There's a little bit of hope in there. There's a commitment, right, to, to persevering and getting better and doing well, but it doesn't seem like, you, like you're in a very safe, healthy place emotionally at the time. Maybe you could elaborate on that and just talk about how you saw the writing, or how the next couple of years unfolded and how the writing helped you get to wherever, you know, a better place now, if, if that's indeed how you would characterize it. And I'm going to ask Roxana to talk about that as well, because she is, that's kind of the subject of Sparta as well, right? And I know from hearing you speak before, that you've thought a lot about that phenomenon of these uh, uh, graduates of these elite schools coming into the military and serving. And then, of course, Sparta takes uh, the after deployment experience very seriously as well. So, do, do you want to start, Roxanne? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. Do you want me to? Chicken. Yeah, please. Okay. Right. Chicken, yeah. Um, well, I was I was really interested to discover a cohort of people who whom I hadn't known about before. I started out from ground zero when I wrote this book, and I I knew practically nothing about the military. I, I became drawn to the subject by an article in the New York Times, and I, it just filled my head. And I was going to have to write a book about it, and I had to find a way in. And I read Nathaniel Fick's wonderful memoir, One Bullet Away, and he was a classics major. And I thought, and and it was such an interesting way to to work your find your way into the military um, and so I, I understood that that was a way that people had gone in and when once I started interviewing vets and talking to people um, I found that something that all the vets in the room know but I didn't um, that there was there was a real wave since we don't have a volunteer arm since we don't have a draft anymore the people who go into the arm into the armed forces do so voluntarily and they have they have reasons and for a lot of people it was um, a choice that was that was filled with idealism and it was a philosophical choice rather than a practical one um, and that was something that I hadn't um, I hadn't really thought about and so if you choose a make a choice like that which is a very difficult choice and it will end up putting you into very difficult moments and you've done it for philosophical reasons and your philosophy fails you what are you left with so that was a set of questions that I asked and I followed those answers um, throughout the book but it was this cadre of people who came into the military with very high expectations and for reasons that, that were intellectual and philosophical and that was a kind of trouble that they found themselves in because of that that initial impetus yeah I um uh, I guess I'd, I'd always, you know, thought about war, and uh, you know, in probably a way that many, you know, young kids do. Uh, you have the, we didn't have video games as much when I was growing up, so it wasn't first-person shooters. It was movies like, you know, Platoon and Rambo, and so you have an idea of what war is, and you have this notion that it seems to be good or you know a good thing to participate in for some reason, and people look up to it. And you know, some people are sort of bitter about it or talk about it badly, but it's not in a way that makes any sense to a kid. Um, so uh, you know, that was always in the back of my mind. And my, my dad, my grandfather dissuaded me uh, from doing it. My grandfather, a little bit more plausibly than my father. My father didn't go to Vietnam, nor did he have any inclination to, and to his credit, he admits that very freely. Um, nor would he go now if he could go back in time. Uh, but my grandfather had been in World War II, and for him that made, it made his saying like, you should not go to West Point, uh, made a lot more sense to me. And then, um, you know, the other thing is that in the 90s, I, I guess, you know, you, everyone probably remembers, you had uh, Somalia, and could, Kosovo and, and, and Bosnia and the Gulf War, the first Gulf War, and there are these discrete engagements where America rolls in and there's like fighting for a couple of weeks or a month and then it's over and then it's a police action. And so that's kind of what I thought 
was going to happen with Iraq and Afghanistan. And you didn't you didn't hear too much about Afghanistan in the news after 2001, say that we didn't get Bin Laden. Uh, and so when I went to Japan, you know, it just wasn't ending, especially Iraq. I mean, Afghanistan was it still wasn't in the news. And so uh, you know, when Abu Ghraib was happening, and a lot of these accounts of kind of you know, I guess in retrospect, mm -hmm. the military. Um, which is not designed for nation building or peacekeeping, spending you know a couple of years in a place where it really shouldn't and treating the population like enemy. Um, and I, I thought that there was some kind of difference that I could make and that my liberal arts education gave me some obligation to do that. In retrospect, I was very wrong about both of this. Things, but what are you gonna do? Sure, sure. Well, the, the passage you read spoke of a mission that failed or it was a personal failure, but it just wasn't successful as an army operation, right? And I don't know if that, I don't want to draw any larger implications from that, but maybe David could, because David spent 20 years in the military, wrote us, yes. Yeah, it was like a 20 year failure, right? <laughs> well, I don't know about my part of the militaries. But yeah. <laughs> okay, so, and in Fobbit, of course, if, for those of us that read it, we know it's like this scathing portrait of life on, on a fob, and, and, and you pull no punches and really taking it to a military bureaucracy and a culture that really can't seem to generate much effective oomph towards whatever we were trying to achieve at the you know the strategic level. So I guess my question is what does it mean to be in the army, the military, to love being in the military, to finding fulfillment there, and yet still trying to reconcile this larger failure, if if that's how you would characterize the larger mission. Yeah, um, it's a very complicated feeling. That's what I, I went over to Iraq in 2005 feeling one way. Um, I don't know if I'd char characterize it wholeheartedly as gung-ho, but it's certainly, you know, I want to do my job, do my mission. Um, I certainly had doubts about our commander-in-chief um, and his intent over there, to put it politely. I can say that now. I don't have to, I don't have, to have a disclaimer anymore. Um, but still, I, I tamped down those niggling doubts and because and, I was consumed with the mission. So when you're working over there, you know, 14-hour days, and you're just consumed by what you have to do and that's in front of you, which in my case was telling the Army's story. That was our catchphrase um, for public affairs. We told the Army's story in whatever shape that came out. And then gradually, as my time in Iraq progressed, I got worn down, they ground me down, and um, I started seeing a little bit of the futility and, and failure, um, both in the, the larger scheme of things and in the smaller um, smaller realm there. So, and eventually that that couldn't help but leak over into the, into the writing of Fobbit. So when it came time to, to write, um, a book which actually started off um, a long in its embryonic phase when it was still a little embryo with flippers for hands it was still going to be um, a memoir it was um, actually going to start off like that but then um, I was writing about myself of course and I led a very boring existence over in Iraq uh, day in and day out you know nobody wants there's not a lot of action at just typing on a keyboard and, you know moving a mouse around a screen so Eventually, the, uh, I got the idea to, to fictionalize it um, lightly and in some places and heavily in others. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sure. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add, you know, I, th I think disillusionment, disillusionment uh, in, in our 20s, uh, which is the age of, is this on? Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, just ha yeah. Uh, it, you know, this is not going to be DA or DOD policy. Uh, yeah, sure. You know, I think that's a normal thing. It's something everybody goes goes through, whether uh, they're in the military yeah. or not. Uh, obviously, the stakes are height heightened when you get disillusioned in the in the middle of a combat zone. But um, it, it's not something. Having you know, I was over there during 2007, 2008 during the surge. Right, there was a tentative sense of hope, right, of, of trying to rebuild uh, uh, the country that we took, we played a large role in in, in destroying, but but it was still there, you know. Uh, uh, we did push the country back from the brink of civil war. It's now back on the brink, and that, that's a terrible thing, and, and um, uh, nobody is more disturbed uh, by what's going on over there in terms of Al-Qaeda uh, retaking parts of Ramadi and Fallujah th than veterans are, right? I mean, there was a lot of uh, uh, blood and sweat uh, uh, spilled spilled on, on in, that, in that desert. You know that said, you know and maybe it's, maybe it's rationalization, um, uh, maybe it's not. But but uh, there were a lot of 
a lot of uh, military service members doing a lot of different things over there. Um, and, and I think it's just so much more complex than failure. You didn't win, failure. You didn't, you didn't, you didn't, uh, you didn't kill Hitler and save the world from fa fascism, complete failure. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I, during, those, during those dark moments, when you wake up and, and think, see the images of Ramadi and Fallujah, you try to remember the, you know, uh, the 15 months over there, some good, you know, some good things did did happen, uh, and, and it was a little different experience showing up in 2007 because there was already a lot of cynicism, right? The uh, you weren't thinking about establishing a, a, a pure democracy in the middle of Middle East anymore. Uh, that said, you know, I, re I remember helping open schools, right? I, I remember. Uh, 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 providing security for f free elections. Um, are they better off than they were pre-invasion? It probably, you know, if you ask an Iraqi, uh, there's probably going to be a lot of different answers to that. There's no one clean answer. Um, so, I, I, I don't know. I just, I just felt like chiming in there in, in, in that. Of, co of, of course, uh, you're going to get disillusioned when you go to war, but but you also get disillusioned when you get a B. <laughs> <laughs> Says the graduate, right? Yeah. Okay. Oh, it's an MFA. Don't get grades. Yeah, it's pass and fail. No, it's a it's a valid point. I mean, I felt very good about my service in Afghanistan. I was an advisor to an Afghan National Army commander, and we went through thick and thin for a year, right? And at the local level, you know, the day to day level, we had many successes, many things to be proud of, and I genuinely thought that the unit was better off as a result of my time spent with them, right? Even as we lived through the uh, 2000 and, what is it, 2009 elections, right? Which actually didn't go so well in the bigger picture, but you know, from the soldier's viewpoint, from the unit viewpoint, you found a lot to be positive about, right? And that had to be blended in with a lot of other complicated feelings. So speaking of like complicated feelings, here's a question for the, for the panel, anyone that wants to jump on this one, then we'll open it up to the floor for questions. What is it, what about the memoir? The memoir, from my observation, written by Iraq and Afghanistan veterans seems to be concentrated uh, uh, in, with uh, authors who are young men, generally lieutenants or captains. And I'm still looking for memoirs written by women officers or soldiers, uh, soldiers of any rank or higher ranking officers. Is there something about the genre that is particularly sort of oriented towards um, uh, young officers? Well, I should mention too, there is um, um, uh, Kayla Williams sure. has written a couple of couple right, of good right. um, viewpoints from the female in, um, yeah, NCO yeah. perspective, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, and, just and had to chime yeah. that in there. Go and, ahead. and there are other there are other memoirs that are not famous, but mm -hmm. that um, there's one called The Road from Our Ramadi, which is I think he's a sergeant or he may be an enlisted man, and he um, became a conscientious objector while he was over in Iraq and wrote the memoir from a military prison. Okay. in this country. There's another one from a defector who's living in Canada. He was an enlisted man. So, and uh, they're not necessarily um, published by big publishers sure. or well-received, mm -hmm. but they're definitely voices from that conflict and ones that are very useful to, to hear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think there's a real fancy word for uh, literary blossoming that that uh, you sometimes see in the New York Times book <coughs> review that's escaping me, but but that's, that's it's happening right now. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, it begins with a B. It's a German word, I think. Anyways, uh, but we're we're really seeing that right now. Uh, I, I'm looking right at two young women writers who are fantastic that that I, I can't wait to see uh, uh, their published work here in the next couple of years. Kristen and Teresa, not to call you out too much. Uh, uh, Hassan uh, Blasim is 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 an Iraqi. Iraqi, who just came out with a great uh, short story collection called uh, the Corpse Ex Exhibition. Uh, um, you know, th these wars were, to, to Peter's point, these war wars were fo uh, fought uh, slash experienced by a lot more people than uh, straight young white men. Um, and uh, the balance is certainly off, I think, right now in terms of uh, the literary, the published literary output. But th that's that's fixing to change um, uh, uh, very soon. And and I, I, for one, can't wait to, to see more of it produced. Yeah, part of it is probably also just a demographic thing. Is that I mean, the, the the place where combat tends to go on 
and has tended to go on in recent history has been with infantry units. And that's been changing since Vietnam, really. Um, and more and more with counterinsurgency, where the line, there are no lines, there are no front lines, you have situations where not combat units are actually in combat, they're just not being called combat units. And so opening up the military to females and female service mm -hmm. has been something, I mean, you, you don't see a lot of World War I female memoirs because it was a bunch of guys in the trenches. Mm -hmm. um, and that is something that is evolving now. Um, probably in a, in, I mean, it, unfortunately, I mean, fewer people should have to, to serve in war, mm -hmm. but I guess, I mean, if, if, if you're gonna have wars, then I guess everyone should, should uh, maybe take the burden for it. And that was, oh, go ahead. Oh, that said, one of the best World War I books is Rebecca West's Return of the Soldier. Yeah, that's good. It. It's, oh, it's, it's, it's fantastic. That's right. That's right. Good. So uh, would you say, would you, uh, Adrian, you were hinting that because it was such a small demographic that goes over and fights, right, that that propels the, 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 the desire to tell the story? Is that is that what you're hinting at? Well, yeah, I mean, if, if you've got, I, I think up until 2008, you had, uh, you know, from 2001 to 2008, you had between 10 and 30,000 uh, most largely infantrymen in Afghanistan mm -hmm. on the border of, you know, mm -hmm. Pakistan uh, and RC South and RC North to a limited extent. And most of them were SF or, or, or airborne. I mean, I had, uh, in 2007, there were 14 females in our Easy Company. I was the EXO of the Easy Company for uh, for five months. You know, mm -hmm. several of them were could have easily been infantrymen, and certainly better than a lot of the infantrymen that I encountered in the infantry. Mm -hmm. um, they weren't because the infantry was not open to females at that time, which is a <laughs> DoD policy, which you don't have to chime in on. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, I mean, it's just. I want to hear it. <laughs> I, I think combat stories tend to probably pitch better to publishers, so that's probably another reason. I, I don't know. What do you think, Kristen? Well, uh, to, to go back to the why is, you know, why are we not seeing the, as many female voices telling the stories? And it's because, like, a bunch of us, you know, male and female, have been pretty busy being deployed. Uh, and so, you know, I know I've been deployed till, you know, like I've just been back a year from a year and change from my last deployment, you know, so it's like you can't mm -hmm. like write your grand novel like while well, you're doing the job. And, you know, it's, well, mm -hmm. some people might, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Uh, <laughs> David did. <laughs> this is job. That's NCO power. That was right? a job. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, but women, you know, I mean, I hope to see even, you know, women writing about their experiences in combat in Desert Storm because I remember when I was in basic training, one of my drill, drill sergeants was a female MP who had been in the Gulf War, and we thought, like, oh my God, she's the shit. Uh, because, hey, women are in combat. Like, this is something we need to prepare, prepare ourselves for. And that was back in the early 90s. You know, and so, and I know women have been out there doing it. It's just the stories haven't been told. And, and hopefully more of those voices will come out. Yeah, sure, definitely. I mean, uh, memoirs require processing. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm writing one right now, but I deployed 10 years ago. So, you know, it's it's been a, a journey of just kind of like healing from stuff that happened and thinking about it and then being able to express it artistically. So uh, another right add to the pile is Jessica Dell's Shaded Black, um, mm. which uh, she was a mortuary parent marine and I actually was deployed with her. Mm. So, um, yeah. Okay, the, yeah, the, the floor is now open, right? <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, sure. Well, I want to first of all thank you because it's a very interesting perspective for me because I'm about to have a book published which will be out in August. And I wrote a memoir about my father who experienced during World War II because he handed a box of 700 letters and said, you may as well have these. And so to actually hear living people speaking as opposed to translating my father's letters from French to English and writing a memoir, it's like this fascinating thing. And it occurs to me that he felt like a journalist and <coughs> in the 40s writing, and he didn't grow up to do that. But did you guys go off to what? Obviously, you were a writer before, but were you writers? Is this, <coughs> you, you thought about this before? You were going to write when you were, I mean, I just find it a fascinating perspective to talk to a lot of people now. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, it's true. I went to war as a writer. In fact, I joined the army as a writer. I was a Raymond Carver wannabe uh, so, uh, when I was uh, when I was an undergrad. Um, so I had this different perspective. I thought um, when I deployed over to Iraq, you know, um, I was seeing it through an artist's eyes. To 
put it broadly and grandly, but you know. Um, and so, and then that, um, and I made a vow to myself uh, that I would. Um, sit down and I would write every night in a journal, um, which is what it started off as. Um, and I gave myself some creative license to reinterpret some of the events that had happened during the day. And, um, but it also, as, a, as an artist, it also made me very attuned and keenly aware to conversations and, oh, you know, this, um, um, you know, this, this patrol out there, uh, when I got their situation report, I saw it differently than, say, Adrian would, certainly, as, a, as an operations type officer. So. Yeah. And just really quickly, and this will tie into, I hope, uh, if, if I, for whatever reason, came across as a chauvinist or something in my earlier comments, um, the, uh, I think being a writer, it's just a numbers game, you know? One out of 100 people is going to really, really vibe with being an engineer. One out of 100 people is going to really vibe with being a physicist. One out of 100 people is probably going to vibe with being a writer. Uh, and so, I, while I didn't go into the, I, I didn't go into the wars thinking that I was going to write about them someday. I, I mean, I was writing about it. That's I think you, were writing you just before. Mm -hmm. you write because I was never a writer before. I did this. I became a writer as I the experience of war. I, I had foggy notions of being a writer someday, but I had no idea how to do that. I, I didn't even know what that meant. Uh, I, uh, I, you know, my, my parents were lawyers. I was supposed to be a lawyer. That's how white collar America works, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, yes and no. I mean, it, it, my, you know, I grew up with, around books. It was something my mom always stressed to my brother, and, uh, my brother, and me in terms of this is a way to communicate to the world. This is a, be a way to figure things out. Um, I, I probably still have, she probably still has in the trunk somewhere, uh, bad yeah. bad fan fiction from the first time, after I re re read The Lord of the Rings the first time. Uh, <laughs> but um, no, I, I didn't, uh, when I joined the army, I was just trying to figure out how to be the best uh, junior officer I could be. I wasn't, you know, going going home and being like, "Oh, this is going to be great for my my grand novel someday." But 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 yeah, you started a blog. You were you started writing while you were over there. So what was that impetus for uh, doing that? To, uh, honestly, because I uh, hated receiving emails. You know, we all have friends that like they go to London was to study abroad, and they're like, "This is the most magnificent." They then they write you thirty paragraphs about you know you're not the first person to freaking go to London. I, you know, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I, I really didn't want to do that. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, the war was and still very much is very political. So I didn't want to send out, uh, you know, I wanted to keep in touch with family and friends. But I figured this was a, uh, an avenue uh, that, you know, they, they could visit if they were interested. Um, and it, it became something uh, other than that, um, which was cool. But uh, uh, really, it was just kind of a... Yeah, and it was certainly related to like. A letter home to everybody. Yeah, it was like yeah, yeah, a letter it, to America kind of thing. And it was a way for me to like figure things out, right? The day to day life was complicated. And if I sat down and forced myself to write about it, um, maybe I didn't have a clear answer, but I had a more clear answer than I did before, before I sat down. Okay, um, we have time for a couple more questions. I see the hand in the back. So. Um, I have a question for the panel uh, regarding counterinsurgency. So. I'm an SEO, I'm E5. I've been to the board a few times. Whenever I go there, I'm asked questions regarding counterinsurgency. And if I get them wrong, I'm told to reference FM 3-24. <laughs> Therein lies the answer. Um, but I couldn't help but notice, as a college student, that there's a lot of academic dissent on counterinsurgency effectiveness. So my question to the panel is, what are your thoughts on the effectiveness of uh, counterinsurgency, does it work, does it not work, is it exaggerated or overemphasized or underemphasized? As a E4 or E5 going for special ops? Yeah, well, I, I, I'd be happy to. So, I, I, I mean, I, I feel very passionately that counterinsurgency does work, and I feel equally passionately that the no military, and especially not kinetic-sized stuff, you know, infantry, SF, operational stuff, is, is really suited or built for that. I mean, SF originally was. Right, that was what SF was supposed to do. Twelve guys who can speak the language, who can embed with the culture. Special forces. <laughs> Alphabet soup, yeah. Um, the Marines have their version of it, too. We need an interpreter up here with yeah. us, right? <laughs> um, 
but the uh, yeah, it's it's supposed to work, and it's actually probably a, a you know a, a way that you can tell. I, I think coin is if 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 a democracy is acronym for counterinsurgency. Counterinsurgency. Counter <laughs> Thank um, you. <laughs> if a democracy is going to go to war in a way that uh, it, it where the power differential is great on the side of the democracy and very small on the side of the the, the oppositional power, then you, the the only way that you can justify doing that is with counterinsurgency. Is saying like, look, we're going in here to do something good and bring something good to it. I'm not saying that you should go to war. I'm just saying if you do, then the the, the only goodness that can come out of a thing like a war where there's an imbalance of power is where you're trying to bring something good into it. And it's it's been sad for me to see us go away from at least the the bizarre and paradoxical ideas of counterinsurgency and focus only on counterterror or what we call CT. It's been very dispiriting for me to see the Democratic Party embrace CT because uh, the Vice President Joe Biden has been the, the largest and loudest, you didn't have to comment on this, uh, um, advocate of that. Because counterterror is just saying, well, we can't convince anybody that our way of life is better. We can't convince, we can't really help the other side or anybody. So we're just going to kill people that disagree with us. And somehow that's going to affect change for the better. I don't know how. Um, so counterinsurgency, difficult, paradoxical, probably crazy. Um, <laughs> but at least there's some sort of weird good in it. Counterterror, awful. To answer your question, counterinsurgency is essentially boilerplate winning hearts, minds, and pocketbooks with an emphasis on pocketbooks. Uh, <laughs> uh, to get back to kind of like, I mean, I, dealing with the board, they're always going to trip you up, right? Uh, that's that's kind of why they're there. But uh, I think it can work. It has historically. The, the, the British and Malaysia is the most famous example. There's a lot of re factors in that. Uh, but I think it can work. I don't think the, the, the current structure of the American military and the American mil military's relationship uh, with American society will allow it. Counterinsurgency takes a lot of money and it takes a lot of time. And frankly, the American public have, has never been interested in, th they'll give money, but only for four or five years, uh, to, to paraphrase, uh, I believe it was General Marshall um, during World War II. Uh, and frankly, that's kind of how these wars played out, right? Uh, Counterinsurgency started in Iraq in 06. We were out by Ole uh, 2011. Uh, maybe start in Afghanistan. You could probably answer this better than me, but oh seven ish, and you know we made it six and a half years. That's better. <laughs> um, but yeah, there are there are historical examples of it working, but there are more historical historical examples of it not working. You know, um, here's where I might get in trouble. These are all my own opinions, right? On this, but, <laughs> but here's the thing about like counterinsurgency in addition to everything that they said which is right on it's just hard and you need to be a certain type of person to be able to commit yourself to it right because with counterinsurgency comes this um, understanding or requirement that you're going to be with Iraqis you're going to be with Afghans all the time right and you're going to take enormous risk to your safety right and it's going to be very frustrating you need patient and you got to just sort of check your judgment at the door and work with them uh you know the, the, the host nation at the level that they're at right so it's sort of a sensibility that the person needs to have to commit to that counterinsurgency mission to understand the culture to understand the people to work with the people and be with the people right and I was an advisor and I went through some training at uh, Fort Riley Kansas which actually this is the army's going to approve of this right it was great training right it really sort of gave you some skill and some confidence at working with Afghans and what it was going to be like with them right and I think that was contributed a measure to our success or my team's success or the advisor's success regular army soldiers didn't always have that much training right and they, they didn't have that commitment and it was really hard for them to sort of buy into the counterinsurgency mission if you didn't have that appreciation for the human dimension the cultural dimension the ability to relate at some level okay i do think we have time for one more question is that okay oh, sure. my question is as a, a writer of war how do you balance wanting to talk to other war veterans and those who know what an e5 is and a counterinsurgency and this sort of thing but we all plain folks that are like sitting here who want to hear about the human condition and i think and i've only read one very good book bob it which is about sort of human human things and human importance. How do you balance that as a war writer? How did you do it, Roxana? Um, yeah. Well, I was, I was drawn to the human 
story in this. Um, and the, the way I was drawn to the idea of a war book was this article in the New York Times, which was about, which was the first time I had seen this, this um, situation. And I can't remember what year it was, but it was the fact that, that, that our troops were driving around in unarmored Humvees. They were being sent out on patrol over IEDs. They were being blown up. They were getting traumatic brain injuries. And the military was reluctant to diagnose them because it would it was expensive to treat them, and it meant removing combatants from the field. And that constellation of facts was really troubling to me, and I just started reading everything I could find, not about the politics, not about the strategy, but finding out what it was like to be a guy in one of those Humvees, who sent you out, what it was like to wake up in the morning at two o'clock in the morning and go out, and how it felt to be huddled there waiting for the noise. Um, and that's what, that's what pulled me through this entire narrative, was finding out what it was like to be that person all the time. Um, I ended up in my book not being able to, I, I first wanted to set it in Iraq, but there was simply too much information that I, I couldn't get. So I set it um, with my character arriving back in, ba making his first landfall in Bangor, Maine, which is where a lot of, of um, the military came came back to, um, and what it was like to be back for the first year, and feeling the sense of isolation and loss, and the flashbacks um, that, but it's a very, very human story. I also made the decision, which we all, I know, think about, how many acronyms you use, um, and it's very tempting to use a lot, because it's the military language. On the other I know that. <laughs> I, it was a conscious decision. I know, I know. <laughs> um, but but you know you are you are cutting yourself off from a lot of readers if you if you resist if you allow yourself to use all those acronyms. I mean there are a lot of war books that have the glossary in the back, which I really don't want to use. I don't want to have to keep flipping back and forth. So you decide: Are you going to? How much strategy are you going to put in? How much politics are you going to put in? And how much are you going to keep this the story of the person getting waking up in the morning and feeling he can't get out of bed and feeling fear when he hears a noise on the street um, and that's what I wanted to tell and that's what anyone can relate to and one of this one of the ways I talked to veterans was to I asked them their own stories and I also said what's your favorite war book and so many of them said um, all quiet on the Western Front hmm. which is a great great war book it's completely personal it's told in the most informal confiding voice and one of the things that um, struck me about it is that so many American vets are drawn to a book told by a German soldier, which was The Enemy. And everyone relates to that book. It's incredibly moving, very powerful, and it's told in, in tiny increments of each day what it feels like to be on the battlefield. He, he goes to visit a friend of his who's dying of blood poisoning in the hospital, and he says, I couldn't bear to look at his hands. They were almost white. They were yellow white, and underneath his nails was blue black. So the story is told in in the, those moments of detail, and you can tell the human story like that, and it's a war story. So each of us made decisions about how much of the facts of warfare to put in, and how much to hold it to the human story. And my decision was to keep to the human. Okay, uh, I'm pretty sure that we in this room could talk talk a lot longer on these subjects that we're all pretty fascinated about with this conversation. But I am told we're out of time, officially. So we're going to have to bring <laughs> this to a close and uh, let the conversations continue unofficially afterwards, right? I'm sure the authors will be glad to hang around for a little while, and there are books for sale, and I think they're willing to sign. So let's have one more round of applause for Roxana, Matt, David, and Adrian. Congratulations on the publication of Afghan Post, and may the future be bright. Thank you.